purpose of the Flick Reedy Education Enterprises is to promote individual moral responsibility through education. How do we do this? We study and discuss the interrelationships of history, philosophy, social studies, and economics. We do not dictate. We do not make statements as to what we think you should or should not do. We do not unduly burden this program with footnotes, references, or complete documentation. However, we do give sufficient data to bring this discussion into proper focus. We invite you to delve further into the necessary historical and statistical data to develop a deeper understanding of truth and a keener sense of individual moral responsibility. The second principle of American capitalism is the profit motive. Howard Kirshner shed light on this aspect in saying, We know that an all-wise providence has safely ensured the reproduction of human beings by the universal implantation of sex impulses. Since physical goods must increase proportionately with human life, it is equally natural and universal that impetus for the increase of production of property is provided. The impetus is evidenced in the eagerness of each man and all men to own and control material things. This natural and necessary eagerness in each individual is sometimes referred to as the profit motive. It might be more properly called the incentive impulse. The profit motive or incentive impulse, as Kirshner calls it, has been represented by some as an expression of greed. It has been charged that the desire for profit has been the cause for the exploitation of man by man. As before, we point out that it is the breakdown of moral and spiritual values that has produced any exploitation of man by man. As far as exploitation of man by man is concerned, where does one find a greater exploitation of man than in the socialist communist nations? They don't have those slave labor camps as resort spots. No one goes there voluntarily. In fact, they have to erect iron and bamboo curtains to prevent their own people from escaping their gardens of Eden. The profit motive is basic in all normal human action. It is the basis for our own most productive activities. The difference between the hope of reward and the fear of punishment is the real difference between our own free enterprise capitalistic system and socialist communist economic systems. But what is profit? Profit is the corn not used for food that is saved in order that a bigger crop may be grown next year. It involves the concepts of self-discipline, self-denial, savings, and thrift at one time in order to provide something more later on. It is a hope, not a guarantee. Profit is the dollars not spent for raw materials, payroll, taxes, which the stockholders give up out of their dividends, so that those profit dollars may be spent later in plant expansion for bigger, newer, better machinery and tools, in order that the future production may be greater. Profit is the fertilizer that quickens the imagination of men, spurring them on to ever newer and greater efforts. Profits provide a better tomorrow in exchange for a little less today. The idea is as old as Aesop's fables, where the squirrel gathered nuts and stored them for future food. Profit is the reward that comes to those who are most successful in supplying human wants and desires, who deliver better goods and services than others are offering. At prices the buyers are able and willing to pay. Think for a moment what goes on in your own mind as you make innumerable purchases throughout the weeks, months, and years as a buyer of goods and services. Profit will inspire more men and women to make extraordinary efforts than any other motive, except that concerned with family relationships of love and devotion. Although in many instances the desire for profit is connected with love and devotion to family. The great American Samuel Gompers, founder of the American Federation of Labor, knew the desirability and necessity of profits when he said, The worst crime against working people is a company which fails to make a profit. 
All of us have heard the socialist communist economic theory of production for use and not for profit. Howard Kirshner put this theory in proper perspective when he commented, Some there are who regard profit with disdain and contempt and speak of producing goods for use and not for profit. They do not seem to realize that unless goods are widely used, there will be no profit. And if there is no profit, equipment cannot be maintained, assembly lines expanded, nor production increased. Profit is the proof that there has been use, extensive use. Business must be profitable, or it will not and cannot continue to supply goods and services to the people. So thus far, we have covered the first two basic principles on which our capitalistic economic system depends. One, private ownership of property. Two, the profit motive. Now we will consider the third, the open competitive market. The idea of the open competitive market, often called the free market, is that everyone is allowed to decide voluntarily what they shall do in providing goods and services for other human beings, and that everyone can decide voluntarily which of all the goods and services he will buy or not buy. In other words, there is a completely free and voluntary exchange. Now let's see who benefits from this kind of an arrangement. First of all, you, the buyer, benefit. Why? Because usually many people want you to buy from them and want to provide a good reason in your mind for buying from them. The competition for your purchase dollar encourages a better quality of goods and services, lowers the prices. Remember the first television sets? What were they like? How much did they cost? After more people decided they would like to try and have you spend your TV set dollars with them, competition became more intense. What happened? TV sets not only got better, but the price came down. Next, you, the worker, benefit in the open competitive market. Why? Because owners, in order to meet the competition, usually have to invest in new machinery and tools of production to provide a better product or service than the plant across the street. New tools and machinery increase workers' production. When a worker's output increases, his wages can rise. Through expansion to meet competition, new and more jobs are created, usually far exceeding any old jobs that may have been lost. In fact, you the worker benefit another way in the open market. Since you have the freedom to work anywhere you can be hired, business and industry must compete for your job abilities. If you don't feel one company is rewarding you properly for your ability, you can always go elsewhere in this open market of freedom. And finally, you, the stockholder, benefit from the free market. Meeting and beating competition requires increased productivity and usually more profits after a while. More money is available to reinvest in the business to buy more, better, newer tools of production, do more research to improve goods and services offered to the public. And the beauty of this free market system is that no one has to try and decide for anyone else but himself and no one else can decide for him what he will do, how or where he will do it, or even why. It is complete freedom in the economic field. So, we have now covered the three cornerstones of our capitalistic system. One, private ownership of property. Two, the profit motive. Three, the open competitive market or free market. Abraham Lincoln certainly appreciated our capitalistic economic system. There are a group of sayings which, if not originated by him, are certainly best known because of his repetition of them. They are as follows. You cannot bring about prosperity by discouraging thrift. You cannot strengthen the weak by weakening the strong. You cannot help the wage earner by pulling down the wage payer. You cannot help the poor 
by discouraging the rich. You cannot establish sound security by spending more than you earn. You cannot build character and courage by taking away man's initiative and independence. You cannot help men permanently by doing for them what they could and should do for themselves. Socialist communist actions are not consistent with their condemnation of the profit motive. They hope to now or in the future profit in some material way. They promise material benefits, profits to those whom they seek as followers. The venom and spite that Marxist atheists of whatever stripe show toward what they call the greed of capitalism, capitalists, industrialists, and merchants, is hypocrisy. Their glowing talk of human need being the main consideration of productive efforts and not profit is double talk. Their record speaks for itself. To say nothing about the semi-luxuries of life, they have not yet been able to find a way under their socialist communist economic system to even grow enough food to feed all their people. We must be reminded that our American capitalistic economic system can be destroyed. It can be destroyed by subversion and through propaganda that aims to usher in a socialism by the consent of the victims who are made to feel guilty and apologetic about capitalism. It can be destroyed by our short-sightedness or apathy in defending the key economic principles of American capitalism. Every American should stand ready, willing, and able to defend rewards for work, respect for private property, the right to compete, free choice in a free market, and a minimum of government regulations and controls. It is a part of the nature of man to try to play God, if given the authority to try. Only in rare instances can their sincere goals be shown to be bad. I am sure they think they know what's best for everyone. The problem is that God has not yet created a man or group of men capable of knowing what's best for every other individual. Having the freedom to own property, to try to make a profit by getting other men voluntarily to buy his goods or services in a free and open market, has brought out the best in most men and women, to the benefit of all others. When capitalism is compared with other economic systems, we must be impressed by the fact that the American system has worked better than any other system. In actual performance, it has produced more goods and services needed and desired by people, far better than the hopes of all the people in the world for 6,000 years. Our everyday lives are safer, more comfortable, and happier than any other people of any other land now or at any other time. It has been said that if we Americans lose our sense of humor, we shall have lost a precious ingredient. So strictly in humor, we shall compare different systems of economics by graphic example. Fascism. You have two cows. The government takes both and sells you the milk. Nazism. You have two cows. The government takes both and shoots you. Communism. You have two cows. The government takes both and gives you some of the milk. Socialism. You have two cows. The government takes one and gives it to your neighbor. Capitalism. You have two cows. You sell one and you buy a bull. The American Economic Foundation has for many years established a record of good straight thinking about economics, reducing it to words and ideas which avoid much of the gobbledygook usually associated with the subject of economics. The Foundation has assembled what they call the Ten Pillars of Economic Wisdom, which are worth our review. Earlier, the formula MMW equals NR plus HE times T was originated by them. Now, let's hear their Ten Pillars. 1. Nothing in our material world can come from nowhere, nor can it be free. Everything in our economic life has a source, a destination, and a cost that must be paid. 
2. Government is never a source of goods. Everything produced is produced by the people, and everything that government gives to the people, it must first take from the people. 3. The only valuable money that government has to spend is that money taxed or borrowed out of the people's earnings. When government decides to spend more than it has thus received, that extra unearned money is created out of thin air through the banks and, when spent, takes on value only by reducing the value of money, savings, and insurance. 4. In our modern exchange economy, all payroll and employment come from customers, and the only worthwhile job security is customer security. If there are no customers, there can be no payroll and no jobs. 5. Customer security can be achieved by the worker only when the boss is allowed by the worker to do the things that win and hold customers. Job security, therefore, is a partnership problem that can be solved only in a spirit of mutual understanding. 6. Because wages are the principal cost of everything, widespread wage increases without corresponding increases in production simply increase the cost of everybody's living. 7. The greatest good for the greatest number means, in its material sense, the greatest goods for the greatest number, which in turn means the greatest productivity per worker. 8. All productivity is based on three factors. Natural resources, whose form, place, and condition are changed by the expenditure of human energy, both muscular and mental, with the aid of tools. 9. Tools are the only one of these three factors that man can increase, and tools come into being in a free society only when there is a reward for the temporary self-denial that people must practice in order to channel part of their earnings away from purchases that produce immediate comfort and pleasure and into new tools for production. Proper payment for the use of tools is essential to their creation. 10. The productivity of the tools, that is, the efficiency of the human energy applied in connection with their use, is highest in a competitive society in which the economic decisions are made by progress-seeking individuals rather than in a state-planned society in which those decisions are made by a handful of all-powerful people, regardless of how well-meaning, unselfish, sincere, and intelligent these people may be. I must admit that the ten pillars are set forth in simple words and straightforward ideas that avoid misunderstanding or double meanings. They are solid, basic facts upon which we can evaluate economic ideas as they arise from time to time.